talking on the phone while driving a vehicle makes you four times more likely to get into an accident. But texting on your phone while driving makes your chance of a crash 23 times more likely. In fact, texting while driving is six times more likely to get you in an accident than drunk driving. Assuming the driver doesn't look up in the average time it takes to send the average text, which is about 4.6 seconds, at 55, 55 miles an hour or 90 kilometers an hour, he will drive blindly the length of a football field while he sends that text. And the resulting carnage is truly horrifying. Driver distraction is a factor in 4 million vehicle crashes in North America every year, and it's a factor in 6 out of 10 teenage driver crashes. 78% of all distracted drivers are distracted because they have been texting. Every year, 330,000 car accidents caused by texting lead to severe injuries. 21% of teenagers killed in car accidents were using a cell phone at the time of the accident. 11 teenagers die every day in North America precisely because they were texting and driving. 94% of teenagers understand, they're the digital generation, 94% of them understand the consequences of texting and driving, but 35% of them admit that they do it anyway. Take a look. <laughs> if I get a text, I look at my phone. It's definitely texting. Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Snapchat. A, texting is like my main form of communication. Boredom, honestly. And B, well, no, I guess, no, it's really just A. <laughs> the passenger has a pretty important role driving now where they're like, oh, red light, red light. If someone that you like texts you, you're like, you can't just like let it sit there without just knowing what they said. Like every time I do it, I kind of, I think about it. I'm like, why am I doing this? And then I just keep doing it. My name is JC. Hi, Alexis. Hi, Dash. Justin, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I just really quickly want to have a chat, tell you what happened to me. When I was 21 years old, driving home from my college graduation ceremony, driver on his phone was so distracted, he turned left into the intersection at a red light. Another car, an 18-wheeler, swerved to miss him and hit my family's car. And the resulting collision actually killed both of my parents. I spent two months in the hospital fighting for my own life, and then two more months in a rehab hospital, learning how to walk again, learning how to speak again, learning how to dress myself and how to feed myself. I live with a partially paralyzed body. I'm not gonna look at my phone ever again. Honestly, if I have been sitting at a red light, and I'll like glance down to see if my mom's texting me, but the people's lives that are impacted from something that is so stupid. I'm sorry, it's hard for me too, but you know this is real. You know the power to really actually make a difference and do something about it. Thank you. Five letters. Just think about what am I doing right now? Smile. <laughs> Smile? Uh-huh. This is so easy. <laughs> Nobody likes to be stopped by the police, but if I'd seen her texting while driving and given her a ticket, it just might have saved her life.
we usually talk about scripture in church, and we will. But if anybody in this room, especially our young people, paid attention to some of those public service announcements, we might have one less, less funeral at our church, and we'd be really happy about that. So pastor thought that was valuable, and I hope you'll heed. I th think we all need to heed. You see, the problem is so serious that large companies like AT&T have gotten involved with campaigns like It Can Wait. 30 million drivers have taken their online pledge to, quote, keep your eyes on the road, not on your phone. But all the tragic statistics, injuries, and deaths, and all the emotionally motivated pledges and promises and PSA announcements have not brought a stop to this problem of reckless distraction. In fact, all of that has actually made the problem worse. One study by the University of Michigan concluded that anti-texting and driving laws might actually be causing a rise in the most serious texting and driving accidents. Why? How in the world would that happen? Well, it's this reason. Because the harder the police clamp down on texting, the lower the phones go in the car. And the lower the phones go, the longer the driver's attention is taken off the road. So, the more the law attempts to stop texting and driving, the more concealed our texting becomes and the more serious our accidents become. Jesus said this about the two greatest commandments in the Bible. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. And Jesus said, that one, love God, that's the first and the greatest commandment. And the second commandment is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And then Jesus gives the punchline on those two commandments. If you can just do those, love God with all your heart and love your neighbor like yourself, all the law and the prophets hang on those two. Jesus summarized discipleship in just two principles. If you want to be a disciple, number one, you got to love God with all your heart. And number two, you've got to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Now, we don't usually neglect those principles because we're bad people. We neglect them because we're bored people. We're distracted. And that brings me to the final subject in the final part of this series, bored into bondage, because that can happen so easily with social media. Speaking of texting and driving, you remember when Jesus was asked to define, hey, Jesus, okay, you told us, love your neighbor as yourself. What do you mean by neighbor? When Jesus was asked that question, guess what he pointed to? He pointed to a road. And the story he told contained a road. Here, here it is. In Luke chapter 10, verse 29, a man willing to justify himself, he said to Jesus, well, who is my neighbor? And Jesus answering said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. He fell among thieves. They stripped him of his clothing. They wounded him. They departed and they left him along the side of the road half dead. Now here's the point of Jesus' story. The good Samaritan went beyond what the law required to help that man who was laying helpless on that road. And a disciple goes beyond what God's law requires in order to please the one who has saved him. The reason our laws can't stop texting and driving is the same reason that a bunch of rules can't stop sin in your life. People do minimums when it comes to the law, but people do maximums when it comes to love. If you ever want to be a success as a disciple of Jesus, you got to put this one in your pocket first thing. You don't do minimums. You don't just say, I kept the standards. I kept the rules. I showed up the required amount of time. I prayed the allotted amount of time. I read the allotted chapter. You don't do that when you want to be a disciple. See, people who do minimums, they're living by law. But disciples, they live by love. And so it's not how much do I have to do 
It's how much do I get to do? How much can I do for Jesus? In the age of digital media, it is easier than ever before to become distracted by distant issues and people that, that, that are distant. They're, they're not even in the car with us. They're not even in the room with us, but we're distracted by them. And those people and those issues and those texts and those posts, they distract us from the immediate people and issues that are all around us. That's exactly what happens with texting and driving. Our phones ping and we ignore the people we should be looking out for in order to respond to people we can't even see. Like the priest and the Levite in that little story Jesus told about the road. We're concerned about the likes of an audience that isn't even present. That's why they didn't stop to help that man. They were concerned of what people would think in their little friendship group if they stopped to help him. And we get concerned about an audience that's not even present while we are negligent of our neighbor that's right in front of us. It doesn't just happen with texting and driving. It happens with texting and family time. It happens with texting and couple time. It happens with texting and social gatherings. It happens with texting and real life conversations. It even happens with texting and church services. We're quick to believe a lie that we can live a divided life, that we can engage with profiles on our phones while we neglect people who are within our reach. Texting and driving is just one of many symptoms of a social media disease. If you were actually going to diagnose the disease, the diagnosis shouldn't be texting and driving. That's just one symptom. The disease is texting and neglecting. Social media creates this viral condition of attention deficit disorder. We don't neglect people because we're bad. We neglect them because we're bored. And when we're bored, our default is to look at our phone. And sometimes the results of that level of neglect are absolutely tragic. Now, ironically, even while we focus so much of our attention on our social media relationships, we tend to create a much higher level of drama and trauma and even outright conflict online. Um, it's easier to ignore somebody's feelings when you post or you text or you email than it is if you're looking them in the eye. It's easier to complain and criticize. It's easier to bash and belittle, rage and enrage. It's easier to shame and slander, gossip and put down. It's easier to air dirty laundry and take cheap shots when you're hiding behind your little screen. It's a lot easier to create that kind of conflict online. All the surveys tell us we're more likely to express anger toward other people when we're talking screen to screen instead of face to face. And the researchers actually have a name for that. They call it anonymous anger. Social media makes it far too convenient to vent our feelings in public through words that we thumb far too quickly into our phones with no thought of the consequences. And unfortunately, the most viral emotion online is anger and outrage. And before we know it, if we text and post and tweet and, 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 and do all of this, and, and we do it without thinking, we ignite Fires of hurt, fires of scandal, fires of conflict that spread out of control. Now, I've read during the study for this series, I've read uh, Proverbs, I've read different books that, that, that talk about life principles. And maybe if Solomon and James in the New Testament, maybe if old King Solomon and, and James the apostle, maybe if they'd lived in our generation, maybe they would have rephrased their metaphors Maybe instead of talking so much about the tongue, they would have talked a little bit about the thumb. Like this one, death and life are in the power of the thumb. And they that love it shall eat the fruit of their, thereof. Or this one, whoso keep us, keeps his mouth and his thumb keeps his soul from trouble. 
Some of us would do real good if we just tie our thumb to our index finger for about a week. James got into the act in the New Testament. He said, I'm paraphrasing, of course. Even so, the thumb is a little member and it boasts great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the thumb used to be the tongue, but now you can stir up conflict and controversy. You can hurt people's feelings without ever opening your mouth just by doing this. And the thumb is a fire. It's a world of iniquity. So is the thumb among our members. And that little thing can defile your whole body and it can set on fire the course of nature and it's set on fire of hell. Now James was talking about your tongue, but in the social media age, I don't think I'm missing the mark at all to paraphrase him that way. A couple of months ago, I tweeted these. They're abbreviated. They're hopefully humorous to you. If they're not, just get offended and get over it. <laughs> and I told you that face to face. I didn't text you. These are from Paul's words, from his letters to our first century brothers and sisters in Corinth and in Philippi. And I'm paraphrasing wildly and widely. Though I tweet with the thumbs of men and of angels and have not love, I am become as an endless tweet storm or a shameless humble brag. Love suffereth not multiple hashtags, and it is respectful. Love exaggerateth not. Love vaunteth not its selfies. It doth not overshare or self-promote. Finally, brethren, whatsoever tweets are true, whatsoever tweets are honest, whatsoever tweets are just, whatsoever tweets are pure, whatsoever tweets are lovely, whatsoever tweets are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, tweet on these things. We live in an age when anybody with a smartphone can publish gossip spread scandal, provoke hostility, unfairly criticize, or unjustly condemn anybody they happen not to like for the moment. And the world calls that trolling. Trolling is posting inflammatory or inappropriate comments on social media for the sole purpose of upsetting somebody else and provoking their response. But the Bible has a different word. The Bible doesn't use the word trolling. It uses the word slander, which means to speak against. Now, biblically speaking, if you're not a Christian, you can ignore this part. But if you claim to be a Christian, this is for you. Biblically speaking, slandering or speaking against someone, it's not wrong because the information is false. It's wrong simply because the presentation is unkind. Because the intent behind slander or trolling is to belittle, to pour out contempt, to mock, to hurt, to harm, to destroy. Slander is not a false report. It's simply an against report. It is not okay to pass along negative information just because the information might be true. Be see, see, the Bible tells us that if the truth is to be spoken, it must be spoken in love. So whether it's true or not is not the issue. And for all the rest of us that we don't tweet and we don't chew and we don't hang with girls who do or whatever that used to be. For all the rest of us who are a little older, this applies to face-to-face -face conversations too. And it applies to around the table at the city restaurants too. Because see, if the truth is spoken, that's okay, but it must be spoken in love. And you love your children. And there have been times in your children's lives that you would have just as soon someone not spoke the truth about them because at that particular moment in their particular struggle, the truth would hurt even though it was true. See, that's speaking the truth in love. Sometimes the most loving thing you can do is zip it. Our phones provide many windows into this new harsh reality of social media. We read condescending comments on articles. We see judgmental remarks on Facebook. We, we watch antagonistic tug of war contests unfold on Twitter. We read petty little critiques of other people's photos on Instagram. 
We encounter unfounded accusations about leaders on blog posts. And we receive text messages that assume our motives, insult our intelligence, question our integrity, jump to conclusions, and hurt our hearts. Charles Spurgeon, the great preacher, once said, the easiest work in the world is to find fault. Fault finding destroys our love for others. Fault finding runs contrary to Calvary. At the cross, our pardoned sins were buried in a grave. But the fault finder becomes a grave robber. He sneaks back at night and again he digs up his neighbor's sins just so he can drag that decomposing corpse of past failure back into the light of public square and that is as unchristian as anything you could ever name. If you ever do have a problem with one of your brothers and sisters then the Bible gave you the solution. It's laid out, black and white, three-step process to follow. Here's the three-step process. If you've got a problem with somebody, go alone to them. If they don't hear that, and you can't make any progress talking to them one-on-one, -on -one, take a friend. If that doesn't work, tell the church. Bring it to your spiritual leadership and let them do it. Listen to this. If you've talked to anyone else about the situation before you've talked to them about the situation and you consider them the problem, you are absolutely wrong. Never are we given permission as Christians to air our grievances or air somebody else's dirty laundry in the public forum and it's worse than it's ever been because of these and we have to still be Christians even though we live in the 21st century. I have a wonderful friend, Morel Cornwell. He's, he's one of a kind. He is the superintendent of the Kansas district. He pastors a great revival church and he went through all kinds of issues way back. People criticized him and people said he was lying about his numbers and people said he wasn't really growing and all kinds of criticism. And finally, in opposition to just about everybody in that area at that time, he ended up on their district board, which it just frustrated a lot of people. And he told me this with his own mouth. He said, I was sitting in a board meeting and it wasn't going very well. And some of those brethren were talking about another brother in the district and they were gossiping about him and they were saying terribly unkind things. He said, I didn't say a word to them. I just picked up my phone and dialed that brother's number. And I put him on speaker and I said, hey, brother so-and-so, I'm in the Kansas District Board meeting and they're talking about you right now. I just got you on speaker. They may want to ask you something. And he set his phone on the table. He said, it shut down the meeting. I said, I bet it did, Brother Cornwell. Thank God it's different there now. Matthew chapter 18. You say, is that in the Bible? Yeah, it's right there in Matthew chapter 18. If your brother does something wrong against you, you go, you talk to him, you tell him his fault between you and him alone. Go alone. And if he hears you, then you've gained your brother. You've made it right. It's good. If he won't hear you, take with you one or two more. Get somebody who's mature. Get somebody who doesn't have a big mouth. Get somebody who's not known for gathering little groups and telling all the business of everybody. And take somebody like that that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. Take them as a witness. And if he neglects to hear you and them, then tell it to the church. Bring it to your spiritual leadership and we'll take a stab at it. And if he neglects to hear the church, then let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. If he's not gonna listen to spiritual authority, then he's not a Christian anyway. So you haven't really lost much. Now see, those are the principles Jesus gave. Go alone, take a friend, tell the church. It's easy. But you know what we usually do? Tell Facebook. Get in a group with a whole bunch of people at a restaurant. And finally, maybe go to that person. That's backwards. Go to them first. It's a social media series, pastor. Can you stop making us uncomfortable? No, that's Bible. Now we don't usually neglect those principles because we're bad. We neglect those principles because we're bored and it's entertaining to talk about people's failures and problems and things they did wrong. When we encounter a little spark of conflict, whether it's in real life or online, every one of us carries two buckets with us all the time. 
One contains water and one contains gasoline. And when you encounter a little spark of something, you can either throw water on it and put it out and serve God and the church, or you can throw gasoline on it and watch the fire burn. And sometimes our problem is it's easier and more entertaining to pour gas on the fire. But is that really what a Christian should be doing? Before you grab your phone and fire off some emotionally charged spur of the moment text or post, you need to ask yourself some questions. And there are lots of questions you should ask yourself. Here's a few. Number one, will this glorify God? Number two, will this edify people? Number three, will this minister grace to the reader who reads this post? Will this grieve the Holy Spirit? Will this promote unity or division? Will this prolong some kind of anger or controversy? Will this be kind and tenderhearted? Will this be how Jesus would handle it? You say, that's not in the Bible. Oh yeah, here it is. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth or your thumbs, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearers. And don't you grieve the spirit of God, whereby you are sealed under the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking, put that away from you with all malice and be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, because God, for Christ's sake, forgave you. So hopefully you can go and forgive somebody else before you get online and try to embarrass them because they hurt your feelings. In teaching this series, I've been indebted to a book called 12 Ways Your Phone is Changing You by Tony Reinke. Uh, it's a thought-provoking read. It is well worth your time, well worth your money, especially if you're in this generation. Anybody could read it. It's packed with statistics. You've heard uh, much of the content of that book at different places in this series. And of course, this being the digital age, they also have a very cool YouTube video to help promote this book. And I think you'll enjoy it, and I'd like to show it to you. to get to Hoffman Park. Hey, thanks. How's your phone changing you? That's a worthy question. The point of this series is not to bash social media. The point of this series is to say very strongly that unhealthy social media habits cannot help but be reflected in our everyday relationships. Our digital reactions, one with another, they're often necessarily brief and quite superficial. And they begin to impact our everyday relationships, all of our relationships. When our relationships are shallow online, our relationships become shallow offline. We become more easily distracted during conversations with others. And we become less patient with others during conflict. Douglas Gruthius 
professor of philosophy at Denver Seminary, sometimes they're the same, he warns, quote, the way we interact online becomes the norm for how we interact offline. Facebook and Twitter communications are pretty short, clipped, and rapid. And that is not a good way to have a good conversation with someone. A good conversation involves listening and timing. And that's pretty much taken away with internet communications because you're not even there with the person. So someone could send you a message and you could ignore it, or someone could send you a message and you could get to it two hours later. But if you're in real time, in a real place, with real bodies and real voices, that's a very different dynamic. You shouldn't treat another person the way you interact with social media. End of quote. Now we're quick to believe an absolute lie that we can live a divided life engaging with profiles on our phones while we neglect people within our reach. Let me say it again very strongly. We don't live a divided life because we're bad. We live a divided life because we're bored. The problem is that that boredom can lead to bondage. Ashley Madison is a Canadian-based subscription service targeting married men and women seeking to initiate anonymous connections with other aspiring adulterers. The site's slogan could not be more simple or more sinful. Their slogan is, life is short, have an affair. The site did with sex and relationships what digital technology tries to do with every part of our life. It made them consumable commodities. Ashley Madison turned adultery into a commodity that for a fee, users could, acquire, could access a, a huge database just by discreetly submitting their email address and becoming members. They, they could now have access to many other members and coordinate secret adulterous rendezvous. Over the years of Ashley Madison, tens of millions of people secretly registered their names gave their credit cards, email addresses, and home addresses. Some of them even wrote out their sexual fantasies. But over time, many users apparently had second thoughts after registering. They went back into the website and they deleted all of their accounts and their personal information. However, a team of hackers broke into that website in the summer of 2015 and they discovered that absolutely no information had ever been permanently removed from that database. The hackers then stole all the data records and they leaked all the names and email addresses publicly. News of the data breach stirred waves of fear in 2015. Suspicious spouses everywhere took the dreaded step of searching the online databases to see if their beloved's names or email addresses were included. Samantha, an alias for one uh, such 48-year-old wife, she recounts finding her husband's email address among the leaked data while she was at work. Stunned, she grabbed her purse and keys and she drove home immediately. And here's what she says about that afternoon. My husband was in the kitchen and he was surprised to see me home. He knew that something was wrong. I said, look at the pain and grief on my face. Do you see it? He said, I do. What's going on? I said, I found your name and email address on Ashley Madison. He said, no, you didn't. I said, you know exactly what I'm talking about. He was going pale. He kept swallowing. I know my husband very well. He was in a panic. Panic, a knot in the throat, a hole in the soul. That was the feeling of millions of people who could not excuse the dark desires of their hearts. They couldn't say it was simply a mistaken click. Their intentions were now exposed to the whole world and to any loved ones who had even a hint of suspicion. In one data leak, 32 million adulterers or aspiring adulterers were outed. 
That list included military personnel, prominent celebrities, even pastors and ministry leaders. Suicides followed, including one 56-year-old pastor and seminary professor. Now, tragedies like that, folks, are heartbreaking, but they're also very revealing. They show us something that I don't want you to ever forget. If you forget every word of this little series, I don't want you to forget this. Living a double life in the digital age has become all too easy and all too convenient. The barriers that made some sins quite difficult to commit in previous generations. You had to go to the seedy side of town. You had to go into one of those bookstores. You had to go in a bunch of the scum of the earth and look for those pictures or those magazines or whatever. Those barriers, they don't exist anymore. And the barriers that made some sins difficult to commit in previous generations, they have been lowered or absolutely eliminated in the digital age. If you, everyone here, if you own a smartphone or a tablet or a computer, chances are you have probably abused it. You see, social media doesn't just lay around passively waiting for us to find it. Social media draws us in. It tells us what we should do. It tells us what we should want to do. In social media, young people especially, because this is your generation, there's a strong current in this stream of social media. And if you can't swim, you could be caught up in it, caught away by it, and maybe even drown yourself in it. Social media is dangerous because we can easily be bored into bondage. Too often, what my smartphone exposes in me is not the holy desires of what I know I should be wanting. It's not even what I think I want. It's right there in pixels. It doesn't tell what I should be wanting or what I think I want. It doesn't even tell what I want you to think I want. My phone screen divulges in high definition pixels what my heart really wants. You listen to pastor. That means that whatever happens on my smartphone or my tablet, or my computer, especially under the cover of anonymity. That is the true condition of my heart. It is reflected in full color pixels right back in my eyes. To be honest, that may explain all the passwords on everything. To get into a phone is to peek into the interior of someone's soul. Could it be that we would be ashamed for others to see what we searched and clicked and opened and chased around online? You may not like this next part, but I am a firm believer that if you're married, your spouse should have passwords to everything you have. And it shouldn't be something that is hidden away. Your spouse is your protection given to you by God. They should have access to your calendar and your email and your social media and whatever else you're doing online. And if you're a young person, sorry, guys and girls, but if your parents don't have your passwords, you should do yourself a favor and be different than everybody else at your school and give your parents your passwords. I would not pay for a phone. They may not like pastor after this. I would not pay for a phone for a child of mine that I couldn't access. It would not happen. It's too dangerous. If it's dangerous for a 56-year-old, it's dangerous for a 16-year-old. There are four traps that your smartphone sets for you, that your computer sets for you, that your tablet sets for you. They're dangerous traps. The first trap is accessibility. Because it's easy to find anything online. The most perverted garbage ever dreamed up in the mind of man is online. We used to be sheltered in New Brunswick. One pastor friend of mine, a few years ago here in New Brunswick, pastors a rural church, one of our great rural churches. And he said to me, 
Pastor Raymond, he said, I'm so uh, worried about our young people. He said, uh, they used to be the center of our church and now they just kind of sit and now they're not really involved. And, 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 he, and he said, I don't know what happened to them. He said, the church is the same. The community is basically the same. I said, here's what happened to the media happened to them. They're not growing up in your little rural community any, anymore. They're growing up in South Central Los Angeles where Hollywood is. They grow up with that every night. And so that's the biggest influence of their life. And because of accessibility, now you can watch anything, look at anything, find anything, search for anything, get ensnared in anything. It's accessible. It's easy to find anything online. Accessibility is the first trap that your smartphone sets for you. The big one is anonymity. Your smartphone sets the trap of anonymity and says, as long as mom and dad don't know, as long as your wife or husband doesn't know, as long as one of your friends doesn't know, you're okay. Because it's way too easy to hide your activity online. Way too easy. It's easy to delete cookies. It's easy to, to reformat. It's easy to do all kinds of crazy things just to cover your tracks. Anonymity. It's the second trap that your smartphone sets for you. The third trap is what I would call connectivity. Because you start searching for one thing and you might be innocent, but here's how the internet works. You search for something and it brings up something totally unrelated and maybe bending toward the edge of evil or pornographic or whatever. And at that split second, either the Holy Ghost is gonna make a choice for you and you're gonna get out of that as quick as you can or carnal curiosity is going to get the best of you and you're going to just do one more click. It's like drugs. All of our alcoholics, ex-alcoholics, thank God and the blood of Jesus, all of our ex-alcoholics and ex-drug addicts, they can all tell you that one leads to another, leads to another, leads to another. And before you know it, they are messed up and everything's destroyed. It's the same with pornography. It's the same with online evils and vices. One click leads to another, leads to another, leads to another. So either you and the Holy Ghost are going to shut it down early, shut it down up front, or you are going to have a problem because of connectivity. It's all connected online. One thing leads to another. And the final thing that your phone sets a trap for you in this area, it's curiosity. Because lust is lurking everywhere online. Everywhere online. You say, I don't have a smartphone. Have you got a computer? I don't have a smartphone. Have you got an iPad, a tablet? Lust is lurking everywhere online. You can go online to read the news and you can click on one story with a catchy title. But could we be honest? If that title is kind of double meaning, double sided, and it's leading you somewhere, you have no business. You stop it there. You don't stop it three websites in when you're bending toward the evil side of the online realm. Pornography has always been the main driver in visual digital communications since their invention. And it is a pervasive problem. Online porn use is a major issue facing professing Christians, especially young men, although no demographic is immune. More than 15% of Christian men over 60 admitted to ongoing pornography use. The rate was more than 20% for men in their 50s, 25% for men in their 40s, and 30% for men in their 30s. But nearly 50 percent of professing Christian men ages 18 to 29 admitted ongoing pornography use. The trend is similar among women, but in lesser proportions. 10% of women ages 18 to 29, 5% of those in their 30s, and increasingly smaller percentages for those in their 40s, 50s, 60s, and beyond. Why would we infringe on these precious young people and haul them out of their activities and their service for a series like this? Because of that. 
Can I be honest with you as a pastor? Because a lot of churches see, they don't care. A lot of churches, your business is your business. If you want to go out and get drunk on Saturday night and teach Sunday school on Sunday morning, you are fine. But this is an apostolic church. And we're interested in getting people to heaven, not getting people in the building. We're interested in people having a saving, transforming relationship with Jesus Christ, not just something to do on Sunday morning that soothes their conscience and makes them feel a bit better about life. That's not who we are. And so, yeah, we would stop up and pastor would make everybody in the building feel stupid and awkward and say that if 50% of professing Christian men ages 18 to 29 admit ongoing pornography use, we're getting slaughtered out there by the internet. And we need to pray or fast or study or get in the altar and cry. We need to do something. If that's you, you need your church and you need God to help you turn that around because that won't just damage you, that will damn you. The flood of pornography being accessed on smartphones, it's a spiritual epidemic. It's an unprecedented crisis in the history of the church. Porn use is costing a whole generation of young Christians their joy and their peace. It is harming their concentration and their confidence before God. It is destroying their potential to have normal dating and marriage relationships. And it is corroding their precious young souls with the acid of unrestrained lust as they willingly give themselves to this stupid bondage. The cost of pornography on their future will be enormous, but the cost of pornography on their faith could be eternal. For far too many ex-churchgoers, pornography costs them their salvation. No addiction in our lives, pornography or anything else, no addiction is hidden from the eyes of God. Our creator is no respecter of Canada's privacy laws. His omnipresence, his omniscience shatters the sinister lie that you've believed that you're anonymous online. That lie of anonymity that tempts so many people to abuse their smartphone, unconcerned about God or the Bible or anything else. They think they can indulge and then just repent and they don't realize they're corroding the very emotions and spirit that will want to repent. It's not that they're unconcerned about the consequences. They don't want to get caught. They're concerned about consequences. But could I tell you, they're concerned about the wrong consequences. The sobering fact is that our private internet, our private sexual practices, those are an accurate measurement of how close we are to God. So the stakes could not be higher. To paraphrase Jesus' words in Mark 9, it would be far better for you to throw your cell phone in the dumpster, to live a crippled life without internet access and go to heaven than continue clicking every link your flesh desires and be the most popular person on Instagram and go straight to hell. One day, Every person who committed anonymous sin will stand before God. And every detail of their browsing history, even though they've erased it, it will be broadcast before the throne of a righteous judge. Every deed done in darkness will be brought into the light. Every motive of their heart will be exposed. It will be the ultimate humiliation. It will cause the ultimate panic. It will reveal once and for all that every attempt to erase their digital footprint was totally in vain. Jesus said, there's nothing covered that shall not be revealed in that day. There's nothing hid now that shall not be known. Pastor, you're making me uncomfortable. 
Pastor, this is awkward. Pastor, this is tense. Yes, it is. So is every subject that deals with eternity. So is every subject that deals with the struggle between holiness and ungodliness, between being a disciple of Jesus and just another clone of this world. It's always tense. You say, Pastor, I'm not gonna be honest right now, but if I was gonna be honest, I'd have to tell you that I've messed up online. I'd have to tell you that I like this series until tonight. I like this series till you got meddling with this. This was a cool little series until you got in my face and you started talking to me about stuff that makes me uncomfortable. And furthermore, I've messed up. So are you telling me that God's gonna hit me and kill me and throw me into hell? No, I'm not telling you that at all. Because the blood of Jesus can erase not only your browsing history, it can erase your past. It can erase your sin. It can erase every mistake you've ever made. It can erase every failure you've ever been part of. It can erase every debauched sin you've ever committed and it can turn you into the greatest Christian, the greatest disciple because my Bible still tells me if I'll just walk in the light as he is in the light, we'll have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Jesus Christ, God's son will cleanse me from all sin. So it's not hopeless, it's filled with hope. But you gotta pick, are you gonna be a social media junkie or are you gonna be a disciple of Jesus? You gotta choose. You gotta choose. <laughs> Lift up your hands if you would please. And I know we can't really kind of pray openly about what we need to pray about, but we sure could just pray to God to, to help all of us. So why don't we pray that prayer for a minute? And if you need it personally, that's good. But we can pray for all of us. We can pray for the 80 year olds down to the 18 year olds because we all need help not to get snared up in this wicked generation. We all need help not to get caught up in the sins and the lust of the flesh. We all need help in this area. Oh, just let that prayer out for a minute. I'm basically done. I got one more verse, but just, just let that out for a minute. Just let that prayer out. Ah. <laughs> Oh, Jesus. <laughs> the conviction of the Holy Ghost is in this room right now. We'll finish up in just a minute. I'd like you to lift up your hands if, if you would and just, just reach for God with everything you got. Just reach for God. Oh, <laughs> Oh, so belebo to roko sheba. I need to do this for our young folks because I want them to do it most of all, but we all need to do this. Would you just reach over, put your hand on the shoulder of somebody near to you right now, and let's all pray one more time. Just let your prayer out. You don't have to pray specifics. That would be embarrassing for somebody. I'm not talking about that. I'm praying, God, help us all. God, help our church. God, help our young people. God, help our couples. God, help our families. God, help us to be godly and holy and righteous. God, help us. Oh, 
say so. If you're filled with the Holy Ghost, pray in the Spirit right now because here's what I know. The Holy Ghost will not abide sin. You get in the Spirit, it'll kick sin out of your life. The Holy Ghost will help you conquer lust. The Holy Ghost will help you overcome the strategies of hell that are trying to kill you. Oh, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Very famous author named C.S. Lewis published a novel 75 years ago called The Screwtape Letters. It was well before our digital age. And that little book is very famous. It, it contains fictional letters written between a senior demon named Screwtape and his nephew Wormwood and they're discussing in these fictional letters how best to tempt a man that they refer to as the patient. They're trying to get him to go to hell and be lost. In one of those letters, they discuss what C.S. Lewis called the nothing strategy. Let's use the nothing strategy. The nothing strategy was just designed to distract that man. So he wasted his time and his days and his weeks and his life in just routines of nothingness. They weren't necessarily bad. They weren't necessarily sin. But at the end of the day or the week or the month or the year or life, it just added up to nothing. The nothing strategy. He would always be busy. He'd always be distracted. But he'd also be diabolically lured away from what is truly essential and what is truly eternal. In our age of social media, Satan is out full force with his nothing strategy. Apple, who invented the iPhone, they finally released in this last software update something that helps you kind of govern your time on the phone because even they are realizing it's a problem. Even they are realizing the detrimental effect of their technology on society. And so they're trying to kind of balance that. And so you can measure how much time you spend on social media. You don't need that software to do it. You just think about your day. How much time do you spend on social media compared to how much time you spend in the Word? How much time do you spend scrolling mindlessly, endlessly through everybody else's life on Facebook? And your life's falling apart because you haven't prayed to God today. It's serious. You'd never recognize it for what it is because the devil doesn't come at you full throttle, face on, head on. He comes at you with the nothing strategy. It's not so bad. I'm not doing anything bad. But if it takes that time that you need to be a disciple of Jesus... You're hurting yourself. And at the end of the week or the month or the year or the decade or your life, you look back and say, I didn't do anything so wrong. But I didn't get done what I wanted to do. I didn't get done what was best to do. I didn't get done what God called me to do. And the reason I have these precious young people in here, and I thank you so much, these guys and these gals have been so attentive every single time. The reason I have you in here is because you can do a whole lot more at your age and stage of life than many of the rest of us can to turn it around now and to make your life count and to do the most important things. And I thank God for that. It can be different. It must be different. I close this series with a scripture that I first noticed 
about a decade ago, give or take. I've never preached it, never used it. I've always kind of liked it. And I've always thought of it in the context of computers and phones and social media, even though it was about a different technology in a different era. See, you can use your phone not to ensnare yourself in pornography. You can use your phone to expand God's kingdom. You can actually use social media to preach the gospel. Some young people, some seniors are doing exactly that. Do you realize there are people who, who can't even kind of get out of their house that on social media, they're setting other people on fire for God because they're doing Bible studies online. Do you realize the precious little lady that got the Holy Ghost and got baptized here a week ago, that that was somebody that's not even living in our country that said, you need to go to an apostolic church and helped her find CCC. And she came here and her first service in the building, she was baptized in Jesus' name and received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That's using social media for something good. And I love this little verse. Blessed be the Lord, my strength. He teaches my hands to war and my fingers to fight. If I'm going to use this, I'm going to use this like I use everything else in my life. I'm going to use it to win battles for heaven and I'm going to use it to spread the gospel and I'm going to use it for the good of the kingdom of God. It can be different and it must be different and we cannot afford to be a people who bore ourselves into bondage. Would you stand with me right now? Thank you for praying a moment ago. We're going to pray again, and we're going to gather at the front before we go. I, I've got probably the most important little handout we're going to give you in this series. This one asks a series of penetrating questions and, and kind of joins them up with Scripture, and I hope you'll grab one, and I hope you'll read it and consider it. But right now, I'd like everybody in the building that would help pastor, if you'd lift up your hands and let your voice just keep on going beyond those hands. And I'd ask you to pray to God. God, social media is no different than my bank account. Social media is no different than my talents. Social media is no different than my possessions. I'm a disciple. I'm a steward. I'm to use it all for the kingdom. I'm to use it all for good. I'm to use it all for God. And so God's social media isn't any different. It's not irredeemable. I can walk into the den of the devil and I can turn it around and use social media for the good of the kingdom. So God, give me the wisdom. God, protect me while I'm in that area and that arena of life. But God, let me be a person that impacts my world. However small or however big it is, let me be that person that impacts my world for the kingdom of heaven. Let me be that person. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. Harre boloko rabati la siesta boho ketesa. Ere de na boloto roko rabahayasa. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Would you start making your way down toward the front and come as close to the front and close to the center as you can? We're just going to pray one more time. We're going to get you out of here. Thank you for being part of this series, and thank you for being faithful to Bible study tonight. I'm so grateful for everybody. Just come in close, come into the middle, come to the front. Let's make room for everybody to get out of the aisles.